Well, good morning again. This is Larry Nelson, and this is the adult Sunday school class of Madison Baptist Church. We're glad you've joined us this morning. Find a Bible. Now, we're in the book of Philippians today, and we trust that uh, uh, as, we, as we proceed through the book of Philippians, you'll be encouraged and uh, you'll be lifted up by the passages that we're studying today. As we look to the past few lessons, this is our fifth lesson now in the book of Philippians. And believe it or not, <laughs> today we plan to finish the chapter, chapter one of four chapters. And so I know you're excited about that. I am. And then next week we have a new chapter we're starting on with a new memory verse. And so we'll get to that after a while. Notice that uh, again, in, uh, we studied in verse two, the father of the gospel rejoicing in the Father of the Gospel, rejoicing in the fellowship of the Gospel, rejoicing in the fulfillment of the Gospel, and rejoicing in the furtherance of the Gospel. We talked about all those things uh, in the first 11 verses of this chapter. And now today, we're looking at verses 20 through 30. We're ending up the chapter, and we'll be talking about the fight, not the flight, <laughs> the fight of the Gospel. You mean to tell me there's a fight with the gospel? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. The apostle Paul tells us in, in his book to Timothy uh, that, he, that he was to fight the good fight of faith. And uh, the apostle Paul then records that he fought that good fight. Paul did. He fought that good fight. And he admonishes us to do the very same thing. So we're looking forward to that. As we look to our memory verse, and I trust you've memorized it well, Philippians 1.21, if you'll go over that with me again, the reference and the verse and the reference, we'll go over that three times and then go on to another memory verse that you started on a couple weeks ago, and uh, I trust it's become part of your life. Again, next week we'll start in a brand new chapter with a brand new memory verse. But for now, uh, notice what it says in Philippians 1.21. Let's say the, the reference and the verse and the reference. Philippians 1, 21, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Philippians 1, 21, very good. <laughs> I think you did good. You ought to be doing good by now. Put it that way, all right? I'm doing better. I know you'll be doing better. Let's try that again. Philippians chapter 1, verse 21, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Philippians 1, 21. All right, now let's let you say it. I'll say it with you. <laughs> Philippians 1, 21. For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Philippians 1, 21. Well, we also went over a verse and found in, in chapter 1, verse 6. This is not the, the verse of the chapter that tells us our purpose. But I tell you what, and this is a precious verse, and I trust it's true in your life. Uh, the Apostle Paul was commending them, and he was absolutely sure about their progress and spiritual growth because he had been praying for them. Now he's writing to them. He sent messengers to them. He sent uh, other preachers and missionaries to them. And uh, that's what this verse is all about. Let's quote this one together, please. You can look at it if you like first. It's Philippians 1.6. Let's say that together. Philippians 1.6 being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Philippians 1.6. Very good. Let's say that one more time. Philippians 1.6. Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Philippians 1.6. Very good. Hey, let these verses just, just do a work in your life, and they can and they will if you'll meditate on them, if you'll go over and over them, and then share them with somebody else. Um, share them with your family. Share them with your, your friends. Share them with people you don't know. Give them the Word of God. The Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. It pierces even to the dividing the sunder of soul and spirit and to the joint and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. That's the word of God. Well, let's move on with our outline. 
Today we're in uh, chapter 1, verses 20 and 21 is where we're starting. We're going to go through verse 30. But we're looking at the fight of the gospel. And first of all, Paul's conflict. He has a conflict. Do you ever think maybe in a Christian's life <clears throat> there are conflicts? Shouldn't things be uh, like a lake with, with no, no wind, no breeze, just no ripples, just smooth sailing, just, just calm all the time, uh, uh, with a certainty, uh, a, a clear path all the time? Now, we'd like to think that life is like that, but it's not. <clears throat> you see, that's the pie in the sky. But we are in the nasty now and now. And because of that, there are conflicts that come in our life. Sometimes, <coughs> excuse me, sometimes we don't know the good, the better, and the best. We have to make decisions sometimes on what seems to be the best choice, but sometimes there's maybe a, a better choice than the good choice. Or the, so that's, the, that's the, the problem the Apostle Paul had uh, in this passage. We come to a conflict. Notice what he says in verse 20. Are you with me? Open your Bibles if you don't have them open. Chapter 1, notice what he says in verse 20. He says, According to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing... I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Let's bow in prayer. Father in heaven, as we bow before you, we'd ask you to do what man cannot do, open our hearts, engage our minds, Holy Spirit of God, we invite you to convict of sin, convince of your holiness and righteousness and your holy expectations that will come to judgment. Lord, we'd ask you that you might do your work in us today. Make your word and the Son of God, our Savior, very real and very relevant as we study this portion of Scripture. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, let's continue on. We have this, this fight of the gospel, and uh, it includes Paul's conflict. Now, here's a question for you. According to verses 20 and 21, we just read them. According to that, the gospel is a blank and blank issue. Now, can you fill in the blanks? The gospel is a blank and blank issue. All right? That some might say, oh, I know what the answer to that is. The gospel... The preaching of the gospel is a, uh, 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 a, a take or give issue. You know, you can take it or give it, you can take it or leave it. <laughs> if you know anything about the gospel, you know that's not the right answer. Some would say, well, <clears throat> let me see. The gospel is a blank and blank issue. It is a, a, a subjective and a, a who knows what issue. No, no, it's objective. And uh, let's look at, right. did you read the verse? Did you hear something similar in both passages? Here it is. The gospel <laughs> is a life and death issue. It is a life and death issue. Preaching the gospel of Christ, and according to what the Apostle Paul has said, it, this life and death issue rests on him. It, it, it weighs heavily on him. It's life and death for those who hear the gospel, it's life and death for those who even speak the gospel. His life was in peril every time he spoke the gospel, every time he preached. So the gospel of Christ and the conflict that the Apostle Paul has here, that conflict, it is a life and death issue. Uh, uh, you ask, how is it a life and death issue? Well, in Paul's life, it's his love for Christ and his witness to others that makes the conflict. It's a life and death issue. Hey, it's a, it's a life and death issue because Jesus Christ died for our sins, was buried and rose again the third day. That's death and life. Now, did he die for you? He says this in verse 20. Notice what he says. He says, according to my earnest expectation and my hope. What do you think his expectation and hope was? We introduced this uh, verse last week. But what do you think this, what do you think his expectation and hope was? Maybe his expectation and hope to Christ was uh, for uh, 
uh, for a long life or for uh, perhaps for uh, riches <laughs> or perhaps for power or popularity. Well, he did have popularity. He was popular with the Jews. They wanted to kill him everywhere he went. <laughs> they, they knew about him. He was popular with the Christians because they wanted to hear more from him because he was preaching the word of God. And by the way, here at Madison Baptist Church, our people come for a reason. Now, it's not just to socialize because these days we don't get much of that. But it is to receive the word of God. And the word of God is taught here. The word of God is preached here. And people come for that very purpose, to hear the word of God. But listen, it is a life and death issue. He says, according to my earnest expectation and my hope. He goes on and says, that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness, as always, so now also. You see, his earnest hope and expectation wasn't for riches. It wasn't for popularity. It was that in nothing he would be ashamed, that he would be with confidence in God, that he would not hold back anything to others that he received from God, and he didn't. And he's given us 13 wonderful books of the New Testament to prove it. And God used him and spoke to him. And he says, but that with all boldness, not be ashamed, but that with all boldness as always. And he was a bold witness from the very start. If you go back to, to uh, chapter 9 where he trusted Christ as his Savior, you can see he immediately began to preach the gospel right there in Damascus. After he received his sight again and uh, he preached. And then he, he went down to Jerusalem. He, he let them know he was a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. He wasn't ashamed. He had boldness. And by the way, he wasn't ashamed of the bonds that he had. He wasn't ashamed of the chains that he had to carry. Remember, this is a prison epistle. We've said this numbers of times, but perhaps some have just joined us. This is one of his uh, letters that he wrote from prison to these people who he met 10 years earlier and as he writes this letter, he's going to be, he's go, it's going to be sent to them to encourage them, to help them, to build them, to strengthen them in faith. But they've been meeting his needs all along. Ever since he met them, they met his needs. And he's meeting theirs. Sometimes they met his needs physically, and now he's meeting their needs spiritually. Ooh, boy, what a reciprocal uh, agreement they had. I like that. So that in nothing I shall be ashamed but that in all boldness, as always, so now also. Just like before, now without being ashamed, now with all boldness. And by the way, <clears throat> that's not loudness. Boldness is not the forcefulness. Boldness is confidence. Boldness is courage. To do right, to say right, it is to be right in the sight of God and to minister to what God says to men. Well, he goes on. He says in the rest of that verse, uh, he says, and so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether by life, whether it be by life or by death. That's a life and death issue, isn't it? Right there he says it. It's a life and death issue. Christ, he wanted the Lord Jesus Christ to be made manifest, to be magnified. That means to be built up, to see, to be seen in him and through him in a very clear way that others, when they would see Paul, they would say, hey, he is a Christ one. He is one of the, he's not just a follower. Christ is in him. Christ is working through him. And my dear friends, listen, when you live for him and you walk in holiness, when you walk in the power of his Holy Spirit and filled with the word of God, preaching the word of God, I'm telling you, Christ is in you and Christ is speaking through you by his Holy Spirit through his holy word. That's encouraging, isn't it? I get encouraged. We, we were out door knocking today and got to share the gospel with one person, uh, talked to a number of people just going door to door. I like doing that because you get, you get more, uh, more buck for the bang, if you, or more bang for the buck. You get to talk to more people. And we talked to this one dear lady, and, and, and although she didn't respond to the gospel, she was listening. I asked her if she'd been born again. She says, well, you know, I don't know. I, I, I'm the same as I've always been, but I go to church and I think I'm a Christian. And then we were able to share with her the, the precious truth of the gospel of Christ how that we've sinned and we're separated from God and God paid that price through Jesus Christ, through his blood. He was buried 
He died and was buried, and he rose again the third day. Oh, what a wonderful truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So he wanted Christ to be magnified in his body, the apostle Paul, whether it be by life or by death. And what that means is, hey, if I live, I want to live for Christ. If I die, I want Christ to be glorified in my death. I want him to be magnified. How? In my death. We've said this before. A number of dear believers in this congregation, whom I can think of, who died and on their deathbeds, and uh, in, in, in the few weeks before their going, and going home to be with the Lord, what a marvelous testimony they had ministering to others with their last breaths uh, and trusting Christ. Oh, that encourages us and that helps us. It helps us face what they faced and they crossed over without, uh, uh, without regret, knowing that Christ, to be absent in the body, according to God's word, is to be present with the Lord immediately, to close their eyes in this life, to open them in the next in the presence of our Savior. What a wonderful thing. So he's asking God, he's trusting God will be magnified, Jesus Christ will be magnified, made known in his life or in death. Now, I'd like us to, to look at this next passage found in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We're going to look at verses 14 and 15. I have them both on the screen. Uh, but as we look to this verse, see if this fits. Hey, this is the fight of the gospel and Paul's conflict, it's a life and death issue. Notice what he says. He says, for the love of Christ constraineth us. That means it keeps us on the path. It keeps us from strain. It constrains us. We are, we are bound to do something because of the love of Christ. Not our love for him, but his love for us, which produces our love for him. And he says, for the love of Christ constraineth us because we thus judge and rightly so, that if one died for all, then we're all dead. Hey, we're, we're dead. We no longer belong to ourselves, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. We belong to him, lock, stock, and barrel. He says in the next verse, in verse 15, he says, and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Did you catch that? Life and death issues. Life and death. Life for those who say, yes, Lord. Death who don't know or don't receive him. Oh, my friends, that's a very serious matter. He says in John 3, 36, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life but the wrath of God abideth on him. That's for everyone. We know, according to, uh, to, to uh, 2 Peter chapter 3 that, and verse 9, that he is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He's not willing that any, but all don't come to repentance and all haven't heard yet. He says this in, in 1 John 5, 12, He that hath the Son hath life. And he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. You either have him or you don't. There's no in-between. If you have him, you know it. If you don't have him, you don't know it. The issue is not are you a good person, have you lived right. The whole idea between life and death is this one thing. Have you received Jesus? Have you received his pardon? Have you received his forgiveness, his salvation? All the same thing. Have you been born again? All the same answer, all the same direction. It's all the same question. He says in John 1, 12, but as many as received him, to them he gave power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Now, we're getting preachy. That's good. That's okay. <laughs> We need to understand that the gospel is a conflict in us because not everyone has trusted Christ. Not everyone has heard Christ. Not everyone has responded to Christ. That's why the apostle, Christ, the apostle says, and Apostle Paul said in Romans chapter 1, for I am debtor to the, bar, to the Greek and to the barbarian. He's debtor. He, he does, he's not debtor to Christ. Christ paid the price. It's a free gift. You can't be indebted for a free gift. 
He was indebted to those who had not heard. He's indebted to those who had not received. He was indebted to those for whom Christ died, and yet the blood of Jesus Christ was not applied to their hearts and to their lives. Wow. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. That's so important. That is life and death. Jesus said it this way in John chapter 8, verse 42. Listen to this one. This is a sobering one. He says, And I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins. Hey, if you die in one sin, you're condemned. But if you receive Christ as Savior, you're no longer condemned. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. And so he says here, he says, I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins. For if you believe not that I am he, again, ye shall die in your sins. And that means eternal death. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already. Do you see how this is a life and death issue in the gospel? Huh, hugely. Eternal life, eternal death. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, Romans 6, 23. Well, let's take a look at this uh, next slide. It says in, in, verses, in verse 20 and 21 that it's a, uh, it's a matter of life and death, but to the Apostle Paul, how is it a life and death issue? Well, it's, it, notice what it says. We're going to be looking at, at Paul's crucified walk and his Christian work. You see, the Apostle Paul was a full-time minister in the gospel. Oh, yes, he had a job of making tents sometimes. Sometimes he was supported by other believers, by other ministries, by other churches. But most of all, the Apostle Paul was a full-time Christian. We can't be part-time Christians. Either we're his or we're not. Either we are saved or we're not. Either we are Christians or we are not. It's not one way or the other. It's not hold on to the world and hold on to Christ. We let loose of the world. We take Christ. Rather, he takes us. And we have that new life in Christ. Let's take a look. We see this in, in verse 21. Paul's conflict. For me, to live, for me to live is Christ. He's speaking of himself. He says, hey, now for me, to live is Christ. For me, to die is gain. Is that true for you? Is that true for you? Oh, that it would be. Oh, that would be true in my life and in your life. For to me to live is Christ. And for me to die is only but gain. Notice what he says in Galatians 2.20. You're familiar with these verses, I know. He says in Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I now live uh, 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 he says, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The Apostle Paul lived a crucified life. That means this, his life when Christ hung on the cross, before Paul was even uh, born again, before you and I were even born in the flesh, we were crucified with him. He died that we might have eternal life. He died to ransom, to pay for our souls. When we receive Christ as Savior, that transaction is completed. And when he returns again, or when we appear before him, my dear friends, that new body, it'll all be finished. He paid for it at Calvary. He took care of every bit of it. Romans chapter 6, verse 11. Notice what he says. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. That word reckon is a, an accounting word that means, hey, check it on the balance sheet. Here it is, paid for, paid in full. Now, you're dead to yourself, you're alive to Christ. The crucified life. 
Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. And the good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. A life and death issue. Life and death for Christ. Life and death for the believer. Life and death for those who would reject or for those who don't hear the gospel and respond to it. Well, we saw Paul's conflict. Now in the next three verses, we're going to see Paul's choice. Notice what it says in verse 22. Verse 22. He says, but if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what shall I choose? I wot not. Hmm, interesting. He, uh, uh, this is his delight. Paul says he has a choice to make. Each one of us do. His choice is going to be uh, to live in this earth now or to go ahead and go to heaven with God. Hey, by the way, <clears throat> it really wasn't his choice at all. But he had to make his mind up to be satisfied whichever choice that God would make for him, whether he was going to take him home by the executioner's axe or whether he was going to allow him to live and be released and continue to minister to these people. He says, but if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Now, uh, what's the fruit of his labor? Uh, ministering to, the, to, to those dear ones there in Philippi, those whom he loved, those whom he poured his life into, those who took care of him. Uh, remember, there's a special bond with these dear people. And he's rejoicing in God. All through this book, he's rejoicing in the gospel because of what they've done and what God has done through them. And they're rejoicing for what God has done through him. He goes on, not only in, in Paul's choice, verse 22, his delight. He goes on, he says this, this points out his delight. And I know the apostle Paul knew this verse very well. In Psalm 126, Psalm 126, 6, He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. These were people who Paul led to the Lord, and he's going to be bringing those sheaves, those dear ones, those precious souls with him before the Lord of hosts. Oh, my dear friends, listen, what about you? Listen, it's not too late. If you've got breath in your mouth, you can share the gospel of Christ. If you can pray and ask for God's power, ask for God's opportunity and ability, God can give you the opportunity and ability you need to share Christ with someone today, that you might bring these precious souls to him, that you might be an influence of godliness to your children, to your grandchildren, to your neighbors, to those you meet in the marketplace. God is able. So we see Paul's choice. We saw his delight. Now we see his dilemma. Here it is. He says this, again, the last part of, uh, of, of verse 22. He says, Yet what shall I choose? I wot not, for I am in a strait betwixt two. Now, people in Alabama might say it this way. <clears throat> I'm between a rock and a hard place. <laughs> Have you heard that? First time I heard that, I thought, what does that mean? Between a rock and a hard place. <laughs> well, uh, I think it means exactly what the Apostle Paul here is saying. What he is saying is, he, I, I have a choice, and I'm in, I, 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 I'm in a situation, but I really don't know which one I personally would like more. Now, this is his dilemma. He, he's, in a, he's, in, he's, he's in a fix. He goes on. He says, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Listen, his desire for self is, hey, if I had to choose for myself, I'd rather be with Christ. That's, that's his dilemma. I'd rather be with Christ, but that's his self speaking. He said, I'd, I'd rather be with Christ, which is far better. He says in verse 24, nevertheless, he says, nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you, more needful. So, uh, and that's his, his desire for others. Which one's going to weigh the most? Well, the, God still had a, had a use for him. God still has a plan and a purpose for his life. And by the way, if you're listening to this, if you understand and you've got ears to hear, God has a plan and a purpose for your life right now. That's why you're still around. And God has taken the, the precious gospel of Christ. And if we were playing a, a game of tennis, he's saying he's throwing the ball into your court, now you serve. It's up to you. The Apostle Paul had his time, and his time was spent well, 
And God says, no, I'm not taking you home right now, Paul. I'm going to leave you a little bit longer. And we're going to see his confidence in just a moment, his understanding that God would leave him, that he might minister, continue to minister to those people. He's left you to minister to others. Whether you're a part of this church, whether you're able to attend or you have to be at home, God is working in you and through you for a purpose. Wait on him, look to him, call upon him. Ask him, God, what would you have me to do? Just like the Apostle Paul on that road to Damascus. Lord, <laughs> what would you have me to do? And the Lord told him, and the Lord used him. And he surrendered to the Lord. And there's a real key. So Paul's choice, his desire for others, nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. And then we see Paul's confidence in verse 25. He knows exactly what God's going to do because he's been praying. He knows, how, he knows the character of God. He knows how God works in lives of others. Notice what he says. He says uh, in verse 25, And having this confidence, so oh, I like this, And having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you, with you all, for your furtherance and joy of faith. Do you see his confidence here? Hey, we have a God who hears and answers prayer. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. And that's found in uh, Psalm 37, verse 4. Now, when we delight ourselves in God, we want to please him. We're seeking him. We're open to him. We're praying to him. God puts a desire. He puts a plan and a purpose in our heart. Doesn't... Or, immediately unfold it all. Praise the Lord, he doesn't. He gives us a taste. He gives us a desire. And this is the Apostle Paul. He's been seeking God. He's been praying for these people at Philippi. Now he's writing these people at Philippi. He's in prison. He could be going to the executioner's block, but he's been given favor in the eyes of so many. Now he's absolutely assured he has the confidence that he's going to continue on to minister, at least for some time. And it was for some time. He has more traveling to do, more preaching to do, more books of the Bible to write. And uh, we praise God for that. But he's got a plan for you. Do you have the confidence of what God's plan is for you? Do you have an inkling of what God wants? We have some young people in our church who have been called to, at least they've been surrendered to God's call in their life. Lord, would you use me? Would you have me be a missionary? Would you have me be full-time in Christian service in some way or another? And... Uh, Hey, listen, you don't have to wait until you're old to start serving the Lord. Ask God for those opportunities. Ask God for the ability to do just that. I want you to turn with me just quickly uh, to the book of Colossians chapter 4. Colossians chapter 4. I don't have a slide for this one. This is a freebie, as the, as the pastor would say. Uh, you're not have, you don't have to pay for this one. In Colossians chapter 4, we have the Apostle Paul who has a prayer request. This ought to be yours. It ought to be mine. And it is mine. I've been praying this prayer now for a good number of years, specifically today, going out door knocking. Notice what he says in verse 2. Colossians chapter 4, verse 2. Turn there, please. In Colossians 4, 2, he says, Continue in prayer and watch the same with thanksgiving. And he's, now that's a, a, a colon behind that. He's going to tell him what to pray for. He says, With all praying also for us, that God would open unto us a door of utterance. He said, "Ask, pray for me that God would give me an opportunity, an opportunity to speak the mystery of Christ. That's the word of Christ, the gospel, the death, the burial, the resurrection. That, that he would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am also in bonds. Uh, remember that the, the book of Colossians was also one of his prison epistles, uh, written near the same time that this book of Philipp uh, Philippians was written. Notice the next verse. He's prayed for the opportunity in verse 3. Now in verse 4, listen. He says, that I might make it manifest as I ought to speak. He's asking now, God, for not only opportunity, but for ability to preach his holy word. That I might make it manifest as I ought to speak, and then he says, walk in wisdom toward them that are without, redeeming the time. Oh, my friends, listen, we must do that. We must redeem it. Buy it back. Don't waste it. We've wasted enough time. 
Now it's time to go out. Now it's time to start talking. Hey, listen, put a mask on. There's no problem. We didn't have anyone that seemed to be afraid of us talking to them today. Now going door to door, we had masks on. We stood back from the, from the porch door. As some talked through the door, some talked through their doorbell. <laughs> that was new. Yeah, virtual by doorbell. And others opened the door, and some who professed to be Christians just stood right out there with us without a mask. We didn't have a problem. Tried to shake my hand, but I said, no, I better not. I'm going to be talking to some others as well. Listen, let's redeem the time. Let God use you. Paul had the confidence that he was going to continue on with them. And here it is in verse 26, that your rejoicing may be more abundant in Jesus Christ for me by my coming to you again. He was absolutely confident that he was coming to them. He was going to be ministering to them. Just as confident as he was when he wrote the, the, the uh, book of Romans, the letter of Romans, to the believers in Rome and says, I long to be with you. Uh, I purposed in my heart to come to you, but was led hither too. And five years after he wrote that letter, now there he is. He's in Rome. He's around those brothers. Many coming to see him, ministering to him, getting, gleaning from him, and he's ministering to them. God puts the desire now act upon that desire as he gives you a vision. He gives you a purpose and a plan. He lays it out before you. Bits and pieces follow it. Be obedient to it. You'll not be sorry for that. You'll not be sorry for that. In verse 27 through 30, we see Paul's charge. Paul's charge. Hey, uh, we saw the conflict. Uh, we, we, we saw the conflict in his heart. What, is it, is, is, do I want to go home to be with the Lord or am I going to stay here to be with them? We saw his confidence. Now we see Paul's charge in verse 27. Notice what he says. He says, Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. Now, he's, I think it would be very fitting uh, if that word conversation there meant speech, but it doesn't. All right? But that works. I mean, let your speech always be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. In our modern English, that's exactly what it means, but that's not what this means. This conversation here means manner of life. Let your manner of life be as becometh the gospel of Christ. Hey, in holiness, in truth, in honesty, uh, in, in uh, doing all we can to please him, that's how we have our conversation as becometh the gospel of Christ. Honest before all men. Not and bold before all men, sharing the gospel of Christ, uh, knowing that God's word is what works in the heart and, uh, and produces conviction and produces faith. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Oh, my dear friends, we need spiritual ears. Those we, we teach, those we share with can have spiritual ears to hear spiritual truth if they hear the word of God and believe the word of God. Uh, the gospel was preached unto us as well as unto them, it says in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 2. But the gospel preached to them did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. Very important. Believe the word of God. Preach the word of God. Sow the word of God in the hearts of others. So let your conversation be as it becometh of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs. So the Apostle Paul is giving them a charge. He gives them a charge in the gospel. Uh, he wants them to know that, hey, if I have an opportunity to come and see you, which I believe I will, he says, I want to know that you're living the gospel. I want to know that you're sharing the gospel. I want to know that you're living holy lives, acceptable and pleasable, uh, pleasing unto God. And then he concludes that verse by saying that you stand fast, in one spirit, he's, now he's charging them in unity. He says that you stand fast in one spirit and with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Unity. Hey, that's what we're praying for right here at Madison Baptist Church. That part of the Sunday school class is for that very purpose, that we might be united in the purpose that God has for us here in Madison, right here with the new apartments being built everywhere, with the houses all around, I'm telling you, find a, find a neighborhood and start sharing the gospel. Find a Hey, you don't want to go by yourself? Find someone to go with you. Uh, there's always someone who's willing to go. I had a couple of different people ask me if I was going out today. Uh, praise God for that. 
Get you a neighborhood, get you a street, start on your own, share the gospel. Just go door to door. Hey, you go to church anywhere? I'd like to invite you to our church. By the way, do you know for sure if you died today you go to heaven? Very important question. Could I take a moment just to show you from God's word how you can know for sure that if you died today, heaven would be your home? <laughs> and when you have that opportunity that God opens up and he gives you that ability by his Holy Spirit, I tell you there's nothing better. And so Paul's request, Paul's charge to them is a charge of unity. Again, the last part of the verse 27, that you stand fast in one spirit and in one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. And it says in verse 28, and in nothing, terrified by your adversaries, your enemies, the enemies of the cross, and in nothing terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition. In other words, if you're going to be troubled by them, if you're going to, if you're going to fall to the temptation to, to, to flee from those who would, who would be scoffers, uh, my dear friends, they're saying, hey, uh, this guy's just not true. No, no, no. Be bold in your faith. You step out by faith, work by faith, walk by faith. Let God open the doors. Let God protect you. Hey, I, uh, I've only been <clears throat> attacked one time sharing the gospel. <laughs> only once in these 45 years. Only once have I been attacked. And I ducked and my assistant pastor got it in the chin. <laughs> I praise the Lord for assistant pastors. They take a lot of abuse, don't they? Uh, just ask Brother Wally. <laughs> I'm joking. Uh, but that's true. I've shared the gospel all around the world. And I went to one village in the border of Rwanda uh, uh, back in the, in the in 1990s. And, and I tell you, uh, there is one man. And <clears throat> I was preaching the gospel. He took a swing at me. I ducked. And my assistant pastor stood forward and took the, took the blow. <laughs> It, it didn't hurt either one of them, all right? I thought I was going to get killed, but I, it didn't. Now, of all the doors we've knocked on, all the people we've talked to, God's always protected. He protected them. How about the Apostle Paul? How about some before us who've gone on to be with the Lord because of their witness? Well, God gives grace where grace is needed. He doesn't give grace before it's needed. And never too late. God's timing's impeccable. He gives grace where it's needed. So trust him for his grace. Well, in nothing being terrified by your adversaries. Verse 28, let's move on with, with it. He says, uh, which is to them an evident token of perdition, but, unto, but to you of salvation and that of God. Listen, when you're living for Christ and you see the suffering that comes around, you can rest assured you're living for him. Um, you can rest assured you didn't invite this yourself. It's not because of the flesh. It's because of the spirit. It's because of the conviction of your life. He says, for unto you it is given on the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. Did you catch that? Now, are you to believe on Christ? Are, are you to, with your whole heart, trust him? Yes. Are you to suffer for him? Yes. The first one's an emphatic yes. The second one, <laughs> just as emphatic in God's word and in God's will, yes. Because that's where, that's where the gospel shines. That's where people can say, wow, there's something real there. We're to suffer for his sake. And when we do, we're to rejoice that we were found worthy, counted worthy. Uh, Peter and John were counted worthy to suffer for the sake of the Lord Jesus, and they were praising God for that back in chapter 4 of the book of Acts. He says in 2 Timothy 3.12, you've heard this verse before, yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus, did you catch the word godly? Uh, that, uh, uh, that little adverb there adds a lot to the meaning. If you leave that out, it doesn't mean so much, but all they that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. That's a promise. Now, you say, well, I haven't been suffering persecution. Maybe you're not living godly enough. To live godly means you're going to live holy. To live godly means you're going to live in obedience. To live godly means you're going to put yourself last and him first. You're going to die for self. You're going to live and walk 
the crucified life. Wow. Yay. And all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. He says in 2 Timothy 2, 2, Timothy 2 verses 11 and 12, he says, It is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. And that's so true. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. Wow. We can't do that. Let's live for him. And then let's suffer for him. That's what God's called us to. Paul's charge. Again, he goes back to the conflict now in verse 30. In verse 30, he says, Having this same conflict which you saw in me and now here to be in me. Interesting, he's talking about the conflict that he has is the same conflict now that they have. And they have that choice. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. They have that choice. Again, verse 29, For unto you it is given in behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his, for his sake, having the same conflict which you saw in me, and now here to be in me, <laughs> it was in him. He says, now it's in you. Now it's in your court. Are you believing Christ? Are you living? Remember, believing, once someone once said, believing is to believe him. Wow. Are you living for him? That's what believing is. And if you're living for him, have you died to self? And if you've died to self, should there be any consequence if you suffer for him? I've been to many a funeral. In my days in law enforcement, I saw many a corpse. You could take a pin, a needle, and stick that corpse, and he's not going to say, ouch, he's dead. Can feel no pain, he's not there, it's just a shell. You can shout at him, you can offend him, you can shake him. It, nothing will bother him, nothing will, nothing will move him. He's dead. For I have crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Is that true for you? Yes, you've been bought with a price. Therefore, you're to glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. They belong to him. You belong to him. We belong to him. Let's bow in prayer. Father, we thank you for this hour. Thank you for your word. I pray, Lord, we might be as the apostle Paul in conflict, whether to be in heaven or whether to continue on to, to minister to others. And we know it's not our choice, but it's appointed unto us, appointed unto man wants to die, and after this, the judgment. Now we commit ourselves to you. These precious passages in Philippians chapter 1, even unto you, Lord. And I would ask you to take these and work them in and through our lives that we might live as unto, the, as unto you, Lord. Lord, we thank you, we praise you, and we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much. God bless you.